I'm Keith Cameron, and this is the course How the Internet Works. This is Hour 3, Section 2, Client Server in P2P Networks. We talked a lot about the Internet and the technology that makes up the Internet. Uh, this session is devoted to some of the application models that run across the Internet. There are two principal ones, a client server model and the peer-to-peer -peer model. In the client server model, which we've discussed uh, particularly as it relates to the World Wide Web, we have a client uh, sitting in a local area network, and that is generally a private address space, and it is in the example I'm going to show here, which is the most common. And it's going to access the server on the World Wide Web. Uh, Google and Google Maps are two of the examples we've used. The two barriers that separate the private network from the public network are the uh, network address translation or port address translation depending on which technology is used uh, that resides in the home router and a firewall. The NAT and firewall have an advantage in that they provide a level of security to the local area network but they do make the clients that sit behind it opaque from the servers. The uh, transactions across this client-server model have uh, several characteristics. Uh, first of all, the sessions are always client-initiated. Without the client initiating a session, there's no easy way for the server to find the client or penetrate the firewall and the NAT. Uh, that is, unless the firewall and NAT have been pre-configured to allow that addressing to occur to some known port. Web services that use this model are generally TCP-based. There are some exceptions. There are UDP services that use the client-server model. But most of the traffic is TCP, and most of that traffic is HTTP uh, for the World Wide Web. Now, when a uh, World Wide Web session is initiated, multiple TCP sessions are usually instantiated, and those sessions tend to be rather short. So the TCP connections are made, the content is delivered to the client, and then the TCP sessions are disconnected. This model, particularly for the World Wide Web, is transaction-oriented, that is, there's typically a get or a post from the client and that is served from the web server and uh, that's the end of that transaction. The server in general uh, has no notion of state which is very different than other networks like the telephone network where all of the switches along the path in that connection oriented network do have a notion of state and they maintain the state of the transaction. That's not true in most of the internet-based uh, client and server models. Server-side technologies have evolved uh, substantially over the 20-plus uh, years that the World Wide Web has uh, been popularized. Uh, initially, in the web servers, we tended to have static web pages. Those were HTML, hypertext markup language pages and they were had fixed content so that clients would access those pages and see the same material uh, until the page itself was updated. That has changed and today many many of the pages of course are dynamic. Dynamic means they change as a function of the, ex of the dialogue that takes place between the client and the server. A good example is a shopping cart when you go to a website and purchase something then as you uh, change your purchases, then the web pages are going to change in response to that, and the web pages you see are going to be unique to your particular session and experience. The interior architecture is an evolution where, on the server side, uh, different processors and different elements have come to perform specific functions. In a typical interior architecture, one server acts as the web server for the HTTP protocol. So that would be a web server like Tomcat or uh, WebLogic would be another example. Uh, Glassfish would be yet a third example. A second server would be an application server, whereas the web server is responsible for 
meeting the protocol and implementing that and maintaining the HTTP sessions, the application server would house the business logic for that particular site. Supporting them both are database instances that manage the application logic data and the session data. One of the characteristics of the web services, which I've already mentioned, is that they are stateless. And because the TCP sessions are short, there's no guarantee that the next time you click on a HTTP reference, you're going to end up at the same server. So if you end up at a different server, then how does the website keep track of decisions you've already made in the history of this particular transaction or session? And the, the way that's performed is the history is really recorded in the database, and then the server is able to identify which client this is and consult the database to pull that history and make the right business decisions for the next step in your session. To enable this entire process, other client-side technologies have evolved. Some of the earliest ones were cookies, which are name-value pairs that are stored on the client. HTTP browser provides that cookie information to the server uh, each time you go back to the server. There are a variety of kinds of cookies that have evolved over the years. Uh, there are session-specific uh, cookies, and there are third-party cookies for tracking, and so on, but that's one of the mechanisms. Another mechanism that's very popular and common are query strings. This is information appended to the URL that provides, again, name-value pairs that can be used to transfer state information back to the server on subsequent queries. The client-side functionality of the browsers was more limited in the beginning, and rather than try to make the browsers overly complex, the decision was made to allow plugins. Plugins serve different uh, media types in particular. File types like audio, video were served by plugins uh, rather than having that capability built into the browser. That is changing. Client side programming languages also developed. Uh, JavaScript is probably the most notable example, and it runs on the client rather than running on the server. That really speeds the client processing, means that the client doesn't have to go back to the server every time it needs to perform a new function or get a new piece of information. And finally, there are programs that are downloaded from the server in the form of applets or ActiveX components that uh, run on the client side uh, even though they come from the server. So this all represents an evolution that we've seen for web services over the last two decades. Here's a simple HTML page that I prepared to give you a bit of an idea around how HTML uh, works between the client and the server for those of you who have not taken the time to look at HTML before. The, the documents prepared, and like other markup languages, HTML is a tag language. Uh, tags are enclosed in angled brackets, and they have an opening tag and a closing tag, and then the contents within that tag uh, are marked by those boundaries. In this example, I've got an HTML body, and I have a header, and then a short video sequence, and the video tag has in it a source, and this is the source, it's an MP4 video, and the type, of course, is marked as that. And I've also got an image, a JPEG image. This illustrates how data is not restricted to text, but video and audio can be transmitted uh, using uh, HTML over this client-server arrangement. Now, to see what this looks like, I simply wrote this script into a small page, and I have a Tomcat server running on my host, which will show us. This is the result of that little bit of HTML code, and this is taking advantage of HTML5. I mentioned plugins earlier for uh, video, but HTML has a native capability for video, and that's what I'm using here with a Chrome browser. So this is the video with the a native control, and this is the JPEG. Uh, 
and then we can play the video. Hi, I'm Keith Cameron, and I'd like to invite you to take a three-hour course called How the Internet Works. It, and so uh, that, that illustrates uh, HTML and how the browsers have evolved. Previously would have been done uh, with a plug-in, but as of HTML5, Chrome, Safari, and uh, many other browsers, Firefox and uh, Internet Explorer to a lesser extent, support these uh, native controls. This is a partial list of client server services that run on top of the Internet, the World Wide Web we've talked about extensively, but we talked about two other client server services, DNS and DHCP, of course file transfer protocol, uh, email uses that model as well as the post office protocol. SMTP is the protocol that's used to, to deliver messages to an email system and the post office protocol is the one that's used to retrieve them. SNMTP which is used to manage internet elements and then of course Twitter. So let's move on to the peer-to-peer -peer model. The peer-to-peer -peer model looks a, a bit different. We don't call the host machine a client anymore. It's called a node or a peer, uh, but it still is the same host sitting in our local area network. It still has to contend with a NAT and a firewall. The objective in peer-to-peer -peer is not to go to a server, but to have a service that goes from one node to another node. And really application has to enable that. There are a different set of challenges on peer-to-peer -peer than the client server model. In the client server model, the server is really well known because there's a URL associated with it and that gets advertised and so if you want to use that service you go to the URL. But peer-to-peer -peer services generally you don't have a URL for the host you're trying to contact. This would be for services like file sharing or voice over IP, the lo local area network private address is not going to help you because there's no easy way to get to it. So discovery is one of the first challenges. Uh, how do you discover the address you need to reach? And that would be the WAN address. And how do you go about uh, accessing once you understand that? That's generally done with a registration process. So the nodes on such a network are generally registered by a server or super node. So there's an application program that runs on your host machine and uh, registers with that site. That site has a domain name which can be discovered in the domain name system and so you're able to contact that server and then all the other nodes are registered there and that's the method whereby uh, you can discover the other nodes. NAT traversal is again an issue and it's even more of an issue because there are two NATs that have to be traversed and two firewalls. Asymmetrical bandwidth is uh, also more of an issue in this model. In the client server model the content was coming from the server to the host in most cases. Here content is going to flow from the node across the internet which means the upstream bandwidth of the node will be taxed. And As I said in access networks like DSL and cable networks the upstream bandwidth tends to be oh, on the order of one-tenth of the downstream bandwidth. Security is another issue for peer-to-peer -peer service. We need to traverse the NAT and firewall which means some sense we're going to poke holes in them and defeat some of the characteristics of uh, those two devices and in so doing uh, we have the potential to open up some security issues for our local area networks. And finally optimization. Uh, Peer-to-peer -peer networks can be either structured or unstructured. Many of them are unstructured which means they are ad hoc. That is the network is not planned or designed or hierarchical. It simply evolves as a function of who registers and where and the server, the registrar, may not understand where those hosts are. So when we go about trying to do file transfers, for example, it may not be obvious which are the logical nodes to act as the sources for the files we're trying to transfer. This is a partial list 
of services that are peer-to-peer -peer based. Uh, Skype, of course, is the uh, application that was purchased by Microsoft and has uh, tens of millions of users around the world. It's a voice over IP a peer network. BitTorrent is a file sharing network, as is Nutella. Almost all VoIP networks are peer-to-peer. -peer. Skype doesn't happen to use the session initiation protocol, SIP, which is the most popular IETF-based protocol for VoIP, but companies like Vonage and the telephone companies themselves have VoIP services use SIP, and that is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Spotify is a music streaming service, and that is also peer-to-peer. -peer. And finally, SMTP, the mail transfer protocol, while it is a client-server protocol from the client or host machine up into the mail server, between mail servers, it acts as a peer-to-peer. -peer. It is in a public network, not a private network, so it does not have the same NAT and, and uh, firewall issues that I mentioned earlier. Here's a short list of uh, recommended reading. These are uh, IETF requests for comments. STUN, or Session Traversal Utilities for NAT, uh, that describes how NATs can be traversed and how the uh, public WAN address can be discovered by applications on the host and thereby shared uh, so that NAT traversal is possible.